Welcome to Ear Biscuits, the podcast where two lifelong friends talk about life for a long time. I'm Rhett. And I'm Link. This week at the round table of dim lighting, am I am I talking to Rhett? I don't know. Am I talking to somebody else? Am I talking to an alter ego? I don't know, because we're about to get into this is this is like breaking open the seal on a on something that you've been you've been keeping under wraps, my friend. Mm-hmm. There's parts of this that we're going to discuss today. I'm excited about because uh, it, I think we're going to discuss it on a level that we haven't. Well, because here's the interesting thing: is that by the time this podcast now we're we're recording a little bit earlier because we're about to do some traveling, uh, and I have I have talked about this like on my personal social media, right? And the in in the by, pro- the, by this by point. this point, but I uh, haven't seen any of that yet. But as I'm talking right now, so few people know about this. It's just kind of it's it's weird to be talking to you, ear biscuiteers, about it because and it I've been thinking about it for a long time. What I have been working on a solo music project under a name that is not Brett but is still kind of my name because my middle name is James. It's called James and the Shame, and it is a country music project, essentially an album with some singles. The first single dropped on Friday called Believe Me. And we're gonna listen to that yeah, and and talk about it and on there's this episode. A, another single coming in August, and then there's another single and the album coming in September, and this is a, for lack of a better word, is a concept album. What's the name of the album? Well, that's interesting because am I committing to it right now? What do you mean? Uh, you don't know? I, 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 I have something. In, okay, save it. I have, I have something in mind, but I'm gonna, I, I'm gonna, I'm, I might know by the time this is go, goes live, but I haven't fully committed. I wanna Man, discuss you're, that. You're playing bit. the marketing game with me. I don't know the name of the album. No, I have a name in mind. Okay, but you're not gonna say that. You're not gonna release because I might tr- change it slightly. You're not. You're gonna release the track list like a. <laughs> I don't know, but anyway, it yeah, is a. That's what artists do, man. I, I'll get into the. Uh, I'm gonna get into all the details of why this is happening, how this happened, how long who, it's been, whatever. Who the features are? Um, yeah. The, also, who the features aren't? Mm, yeah. Uh, but what I will say, what is I'm that saying is, I'm not featured. It is a. We'll, be t- we'll talk about that. It is an exploration of my spiritual deconstruction through the means of country music. Um, and so I tried to come up with a cool way to describe that, like yeah. deconstruction and country, but all I came up with is decountry, which That's is not which is not great. So That's not it. It's, you're, it's, you're still trying to figure out how to talk about this project. This is the interesting thing, because this is not like this isn't that, this isn't my day job. My day job is what we do. This is my hobby and my side gig. Interestingly, you're you got this new crazy watch that you're wearing for the first time, and it's making all kinds of light. Oh, it's analyzing everything. But like it's like shi- almost shy. It's so loose, right? Why is it so loose? Because it's it's so loose when you go like this. It's shining in my eye. Uh, I'm sorry, Christy. Christy said the same thing. I gotta I gotta figure it out. I gotta figure out I, if I want to tighten it. Christy said it was too loose? She said it was shining in her eyes too. It was, <laughs> it's like, it's like, brrr, it's she like said talking that to a robot. Night. Well, it's analyzing like my my biometrics. But it needs to be tightly analyzing it, I not know, like from I, a distance. But I feel like if it gets too tight, then my hand will fall off. <laughs> well, that's, well, let's Listen, do it. That's a whole nother episode. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm not making this about me. But, so, but what I'm getting at is this isn't something that I've been like scheming and thinking about in a really strategic way. It's, it's a very organic thing that just, so this is actually a lot of the things that I'm saying right now, first time I've thought about them. First time I've thought about like, oh, how do you, and I made, and I actually made the commitment to myself, like last night I was like, should I think about what I'm gonna say? I was like, no, that's what this forum is for, is like, I'm just gonna think about it out loud because I've just been focusing on getting the music done and being happy with the music and a couple of the things that you have to do, like, well, oh, you gotta have album art, uh, uh, okay, you know, and that kind of thing, so, but I haven't been thinking about this from a, how am I gonna talk about this to people who aren't 
already our fans and, and already Mythical Beasts. Somebody who's like, I'm just a person who listens to country music and there's a new artist out there and I'm gonna check them out. Well, they're not listening to this, <laughs> well, so this is different. Yeah, well, we'll talk about that, who I think who I think it's for. Yeah, but we know who's listening to this. Oh yeah, 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 just Mythical Beasts. Uh, I, if I may make a suggestion about like formatting of this thing, I don't, I, I would like to talk about the project um, and and really get into the details of it and kind of to the point we were just making for this audience and for this venue, what I don't wanna do is I don't wanna start making it about like what does it mean for us first, but I, I, w I would like to get into yeah, that. We'll talk like about I, that. I think that, you know, uh, listeners will be interested in like what, what it, how has this played out in terms of our dynamic for for you to be doing this solo project? Yeah, because Rat it's a, going solo. How does what? What's my take on that? How did? What? What are both of our experiences with you doing a the first bona fide solo project? Even if it is a side project and a hobby thing, it you know I think that's something for us to work out, but not work out, but something for us to just talk through. Yeah, we talked through it a little bit, but I think that would be a uh, a good. Edifying and conversation it, and it, for and us. It might answer some questions that people have, like, "What is it?" If you, because I'm sure, I mean, actually, actually, that was one of my worries in doing this thing. We'll talk. Well, you know, we'll talk about that. That we're going to say, like you said, you're going to save that for the second half of the conversation. Let's let's yeah, talk about how this happened. That's exactly what I'm saying. Let's save it for the second half of the conversation after we've just talked about the project in and of itself. Okay. You know. So. Okay. So how did this happen? How did this happen? Um, and and can I just make a quick plug? Yeah, uh, because it's very timely. As of the the release of this episode, uh, I'm doing an AMA. You know, we, every month we do an AMA on the Mythical Society. It's on Discord. Uh, but you're going so solo for this text. AMA. I'm actually going solo, but I'm I'm bringing on another guest, Lily. So Lily, my daughter, and I are are doing an AMA on the Mythical Society today. At what is the day's date? Today is July 18th in the year 2022. Yep. At 3.30 Pacific, 6.30 Eastern on the Discord of the Mythical Society. We're doing an hour long AMA. So uh, tune into that. And if you're listening to this later, all the AMAs, the ones we do every single month, and the one I'm doing with Lily today will be archived so you can like read through all the questions and our answers. And so that's today. So let's get into it, James. Um. Should I call you James the rest of today? Um, you know, I mean, you call me, what, call me what you want to. Let's say yeah. I, 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 James is the name I use when I order food from any place, including Starbucks, because it's a name people can understand. But now it's your. But now your, it's my. Your, I wouldn't call this an alter ego, because an alter ego is you purposely tried to disassociate yourself from, and this is just like, Brett James McLaughlin, who is me has a solo music project that is called James and the Shame. I'm still working on the best way to, to explain that, but we'll talk about why I'm not just, hey, why aren't you just Brett McLaughlin? We'll, we'll get to that. So how did this start? So obviously, um, you know, I have a guitar. <laughs> let's, let's start there. I don't think I know the answer to this, by the way. Um, so yeah, so. I'm very, very interesting. So the two of us have written and recorded. I actually, it's funny because I was I was putting together the the bio that's going to be like on Spotify, etc. You and I have written and recorded over a hundred songs, easily over a hundred. It might be close to one hundred and fifty, but like it wow. Went, um, and so because I I wrote something like a stark departure from his over one hundred multi genre comedic songs written and recorded as part of the duo Rhett and Link, you know. Should have said Lonely Island. Um, it would have helped you. I think we've written and recorded more, way more songs than Lonely Island. Maybe not as good, but okay, a lot yeah, more. Just yeah. we're more prolific in certain ways, in, in terms of the number of tracks. But we've written a lot of music, and uh, you know, the majority of that music was written in a way where it was like I had a guitar somewhere, and I would like come up with some some rhythm and structure, and just like put it in a voice memo, and then show up, and we would write to it, right? So 
it has been a habit over the past 20 years. I've got a guitar in every place that I go. I've got a guitar in the office, I got a guitar in my bedroom. But we tend to get really busy with things and I'll go months without picking my guitar up. And uh, we just get so deep into some new project that may or may not have music. And if it doesn't have music, it's just like, I'm not picking my guitar up. My fingers start, I was like, ah, oh, I don't have calluses anymore. On my, like they wear off. But I think it was 2019 and my guitar is in, in, in my bedroom and I pick it up and I'm kinda like just diddling around on it. And the next thing you know, I'm- Diddling yourself. I'm beginning to write us, and this is, now this is unusual because I've never done this. In the past 20 years, if I start playing something and start singing something and start writing something, it is always exclusively uh, what I would call a business decision, hmm. okay? It means I am writing this song as part of the mythical thing that me and you have built together and it is obviously going to be for the purpose, it's a comedy song. It's, you know, we could use this in something or whatever, or or I need to write a song for Buddy System soundtrack or something like that, right? Right, which I think is the last time we were really intensely writing songs was Buddy System season two and it was so. Well, actually it was the music for the tour. The, 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 That's the, right, the, the, we wrote, the, the we few came songs, back and we wrote. The few new songs that we, like Why I Travel, Kyle, the shirt song. Which interestingly enough, like so Buddy System season two, it was, it was very collaborative, it was very um, last minute to the point where we were going on separate vacations right before filming and we had to divide up songs, something we had never done and you said. Yeah, because we were so under, under we the were, gun. We were so under the gun, I had, to, I had to write one song, you had to write another song and we had to commit that we were both gonna bring them back basically done. Yeah. Which was unusual. And then when we, for the tour, um, uh, the Retin Link live tour in 2019, mm -hmm. you wanted to start playing piano and so then you were like, you made yourself write Why I Travel on the piano. That really wasn't, I, I, didn't, I didn't add too much to that song as much as I recall, I don't recall that yeah. doing much to it. And then in the other ones like Kyle, that was a little more collaborative and then the, the shirt song it just isn't memorable. <laughs> I mean, it had well, a memorable scene when we were shirt, fighting. The but. shirt song is a is a is performance art. It's not really a song that you want to listen to. Yeah, it's a song. But, but those the song you might want to watch. You happen. just kind of went away and wrote those because again, we were in this divide and conquer mode, and it and music. You know, and the tour was kind of like get it, we get in where you fit in kind of thing. Yeah. So there was a little bit of even in that. Yeah, you would sit. You started more and more initiating Rhett and Link songs on your own. But this yeah. time, in 2019, you sat down, you weren't thinking about a business move, you weren't thinking about an obligation, a, cr I, a creative obligation. I was like, I've got this idea, and really it wasn't like, I'm going to sit down and write a song, it was like, I'm playing the guitar and I kinda like what I'm hearing here, and I'm just starting to kinda sing a melody, usually I'll sing a melody that is nonsensical, words that just sound good, and I'll make a voice memo, just so it's just like, oh, I wanna remember this melody that I came up with. And you sit, you sing words that sound good that don't make sense, right? This is a very common songwriting technique. And so, but I was like, see, I was saying words that did make sense and I realized that I was writing a song to God, okay? I was writing a song to God. Oh. And when I say writing a song to God as someone who doesn't necessarily believe in God at this point, um, I was writing a song to the idea that I had of God in the past. And you know, basically writing a song, like I had a relationship with you. So if you don't know. Do, do you remember the first line that kind of came out of it? I still remember when we used to talk. You never said much, but I knew what you thought. Hmm. Huh. Um, so that was the first line that came out. And so I was like, oh, this is kind of like if you don't if you're not a if you're not a Christian or a former Christian or a spiritual person, maybe you wouldn't pick up on the thematic imagery here and you might think I'm just writing a song about a lost love because it's about a relationship that you had and like being like I've got these old let it's called old letters. It's like I've got these old letters that you wrote to me. And I and I sit down and read them, the Bible. You know, I don't like giving all the. I want you to listen to the music and interpret it for yourself. But 
this one's pretty obvious, I guess. Um, but I was writing it and I was like, I don't know who this is for. I don't know why, I don't know. I, like, I'm not like, I'm writing a song because I'm going to have a music project one day. It was very much just like, oh, this is coming out of me in a very easy way. The, like, and I'm not, it's interesting because I'm not trying to be funny. There's no jokes in this song. It's very serious and it's very sincere. Hmm. And it happened very quickly. That's one of the things about almost all, there's 11 songs on the finished album and all of them, you know, the process between beginning to write and then record or like fine tuning the lyrics, that may have been a months long process, but with rare exception, the writing of the music and the first pass at the song is usually something that happens when I just sit down and do it in about one to two hours. And then you go, I've got a song, right? I'm gonna come back, I'll change that lyric, I'll work on that, whatever, but they usually come out really easy. If they, if, if I sit down and it's hard, I'm like, I, I'm doing this for fun. It's not a business decision, it's not a job, so yeah. I'm not, there's no forced creative. So th so this first song, so, Letters, yeah. yeah, it's, it, it came out, it, it pretty much came to, it formed in that sitting, and yeah. then what? So. I sat down and like recorded a, I recorded a demo of it, but I wouldn't have called it a demo. I was just like, oh, I'm gonna record this. And I actually recorded it in like the Evernote audio record. I don't know if you've ever done this, but like mm -mm. Evernote ha has a, you can press add audio and it's, a, it's so low quality. It sounds like something like out of the 20s compared to like if you just do a voice memo oh. and attach it, interestingly. Um, and I was just like, okay, I did that. Now this is 2019. At some point after that, I would say months after that, I just kind of told my therapist about it. I was like, "Yeah, I, you know, I, I, I wrote. We, we were having lots." Wanna, can you pull it up? Play a little bit of it. I don't want to do that because that's not that's not the that's okay. not the single. Okay, it's actually right. the last song on the album. Okay, um, uh, maybe I'll play that when because uh, you can see how different the final version ended up being. Uh, maybe that's I'll, fair. If, if we it, once fair. the album comes out. Um. But I t I'm talking to my therapist about it and we were having a lot of broader conversations about me getting into a place where I was in creative flow and him just making rec just recognizing like, seems like when you are in, you're healthy and you're thriving and you're experiencing joy when you're in a creative flow. Now obviously, I'm in a creative flow a lot with what we do for a living because this is a creative business, this is a content business. So that I'm doing lots of writing. I'm do you know I'm doing a lot of creative things, but it's also a very sophisticated business with a lot of moving parts. And those business parts, which I do think that both of us are really good at, isn't necessarily life giving and doesn't breathe a lot of joy. It's kind of like, well, if you want to do this right, you got to do this right. So you got to answer these business questions, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah, for other people, business can get them into flow, but that's not really our thing. Yeah, and so. He would, it, my therapist, without getting specific, was just like saying, like, yeah, you should just, you know, I'm telling him about writing this song. He's like, you, when you talk about that, you know, I kind of see you light up a little bit. So I would just encourage, I would just encourage you to continue to just, you know, express yourself creatively as a, and move towards things where you can express yourself creatively. He wasn't being like, go do an album. <laughs> um, so. I, you know, it wasn't like I was like, okay, yes, I'm gonna do that. It was like, yeah, yeah, I, I really enjoyed that. Maybe I'll do it again. Pandemic rolls around, oh, 2020. Yeah. And our lives changed drastically like everyone else's. We were obviously still really busy. We were doing everything that we were doing with Mythical and trying to keep all our content streams going. But, you know, less travel, more time at home. Um, I got this guitar in my bedroom. I got a guitar at the creative house. I got a guitar here. I got guitars everywhere, right? And so I just found myself as a way of sort of like passing the time, picking up my guitar and beginning to play. And I just started finding that every time I did that, a song would come out of nowhere, right? Hmm. Um, and so then, I, before I knew it, I had written a song to my parents. I had written a song to my children. I had written a song to my wife. You know, I talked about the song that I wrote for Valentine's Day that we know, that we we talked about on the podcast. Yeah. That I played for her, which is a song that I ended up writing for her. 
Oh yeah, you're talking. You're not talking about when you were dating. You're talking about like I did it when 20, I was dating too. I'm talking about like you did a twenty like, like twenty. It's probably 2020, 2021 Valentine's Day is when I probably talked about it. Okay. Um, but all what was happening was is all without any real calculation. All the songs that I was writing were more like it was a cathartic sort of therapeutic way of thinking about my deconstruction. So I, I point out those songs, and one to my parents, one to my kids, one to my wife, as the, what was happening with me is I've had this very long process of deconstruction. And as I've talked about many times, my spiritual deconstruction on its surface, is, it was a very intellectual thing, right? I wasn't wronged by someone emotionally. I didn't have a pastor do me wrong. I wasn't like, I didn't have the, you know, the rug pulled out from underneath me. It was just a very slow process of access to new information that was increasingly more difficult to reconcile with my Christian worldview to the point, to the breaking point, mm -hmm. right? But that doesn't mean that there weren't um, incredibly heavy emotional things happening relational things like deconstructing from a faith that your parents gave you and they still have. Being a father to kids when they were born, you're taking them up in front of the church and dedicating them to God and then no longer believing in that God in the same way and no longer adhering to a biblical or Christian worldview and still wanting the best for them. Like, what is that? So what I would find is that the way for me to process all these emotions was to write a song about it. So I started talking more and more to my therapist about this and he was like, this is bringing something out in you. Like, and just started talking to Jesse about it. And she was like, it's not, you know, anyone who knows me well knows that it's, you know, I am a, I am a very emotional person, but on the surface it'd be, it, you don't, you don't see, you don't see that, but there's a lot, there's a lot going on. You gotta kind of tap into it and you gotta, it has to come out in a certain way for you to be like, oh, this dude was feeling a whole lot of things. Mm -hmm. And so I just kept going and going. And again, the thought as I was writing these songs was like, this is a therapeutic cathartic process. Now, of course, I am a full-time entertainer. Uh, and so as I'm getting to like the third and fourth song, I'm like, I'm making something here. Yes, I'm doing this for myself, yes, it is a therapeutic process. Yes, I do feel like there's like an emotional release every time I do this, but I'm making something here. It's kind of, you know, yeah, it's this, th there's a tension of, I mean, yeah, you're doing something for therapy, but then you're also, a, you're not just a creative person, but you are an entertainer. And so, it's, I mean, there's echoes of the conversation that we had about like why you're growing your hair out. Like this, it originated in therapy and you were like, it was a therapeutic exercise, but at a certain point you're like, I actually think I will look good with my hair like this. I think my wife will like me better. I think that this, it, this fits into my brand. You know, these things are things that you can't help but think about because of the position that you have well, in life. Well, and not just that, it's also my personality as an Enneagram three, which I don't, you know, I'm, not everybody, every, some people get tired of hearing about the Enneagram, I get it. But the Enneagram three, just think about it this way, it just means you're performance minded. It means that you find your value and your worth in what you can perform for people in winning, right? Right, so there's. And it's very unhealthy. <laughs> it, can, it can be very unhealthy. And it goes with you into every endeavor, even like something that, it, like nothing for anybody is is like absolutely pure. It's like we're not, you know. Uh, yeah. But that doesn't mean you can't be aware of it and still have, like I believe that this can be a um, relatively pure endeavor. Well, it's funny because I've, I have a song that I've already written. I've written multiple additional songs that are not on the album that I guess will be for something in the future, but one of them is about this exact process. Huh. You know, that talks about I I ain't sure what I'm trying to prove or who I'm trying to prove it to. You know what I'm saying? Like that's the that that's the treadmill that the 3 is okay. on constantly, which is really me I wrote it when I when we I finished the the album and I'm thinking about this process that I'm in right now which you know cuz I've been telling you about it like it's one thing to write the music and I love the process of writing 
I love the process of recording. I love the process of collaborating with talented people who make what I wrote better than what it would be if I was the one in charge from the beginning to the end. I love all that. Uh, but as I get into the process of like, okay, well you have to like have a bio and you gotta have like, you gotta get pictures taken. And you, Once I started beginning to do these things that feel very performative and marketing oriented is when I started thinking about the built in irony of doing something that is personal, cathartic, therapeutic, beneficial to me, and then turning it into a consumable product, which is checking all the threes performance boxes. Mm -hmm. So I wrote a song about that, but it's not on the album because it's about the process of doing this, right? So but just to go back, so at a yeah. certain point, you had amassed a number of songs like what was, you made a decision that you were gonna m make this an album. Well when I got to like four songs, I was like I two more songs and I've got like an EP. I mean, you can do a four song EP, but I was like a six song EP, like that's, that's, that's respectable, that's something. I can, I can write two, so, but that process was very much, it wasn't calculated, it was like I, as I would keep talking about this stuff with, with my therapist and with Jesse, I'd be like, you know, I feel like these songs need to be released into the wild. They need to be put into the world. And here's my thinking on that. So you know that I'm a big fan of uh, David Bazan, uh, who, Pedro the Lion. He, he's, uh, he's probably even more known for That's his band, his Pedro band the name. Lion. So uh, he is a guy that grew up in a Christian home and was very much a, a, a you know, strong, very similar story. And then he deconstructed, and he was actually making like Christian music, I think, back in the day with Pedro the Lion. And then, of course, he deconstructed, and it kind of his music evolved with his worldview. But he made an album probably in the late two, two, the alts, like two thousand eight, two thousand nine, called "Curse, Curse the Branches." It's "Curse Your Branches" or "Curse the Branches," um, and it was essentially his deconstruction album. Right, and it was a little bit of an angry album, uh, in that he was kind of like he was, you know, a little bit angry at the world that he had come from, uh, but also it was just deeply, it was so thoughtful and so like specifically connecting to what I now I wasn't listening to it in two thousand eight, two thousand nine when it came out. I listened to it probably uh, almost ten years later. Yeah, I listened to it once, and it just, yeah, it was it was a bit of a downer. Yeah, but I was just like, man, this is this is so meaningful to me because of my particular experience. Yeah. And I was like, you know, I I'd, I'd love to make the album that I would want to listen to, right? Yes, I've heard that before. Write the book that you would want to read. So I was like, okay, I'm going to I'm going to make this music. It's the music that I would want to listen to as someone who's kind of been through or going through what I went through. Um and so then it was like, this could be a gift to those people who have, who can relate to this story, can, you know? And not just people who, again, it's, I, this, is a, this is a super niche thing. Again, it's very much a country album, which is not necessarily like the most popular genre of music, uh, but it's the, it's the genre of music that I can personally write and sing in a credible way. Let's get more you into that after listening to it. Uh, but it's my per it's also personally my favorite type of music. Um, but the subject matter is very, sp at least for this this album, is very specific because every song is related to that process. Yeah. And again, that's when it became this thing like, well, this should be something that is released because it's it's so deeply personal and emotional. And I know that there's so many people out there going. Th this is this is a cultural movement. We talked about it many times people reevaluating their traditional worldviews, whatever your traditional worldview, doesn't have to be Christianity specifically, but like we're in an era where you're bombarded with so many perspectives and so much information that it's becoming increasingly difficult to hold on to any traditional view that requires putting your blinders on and blocking out everyone else's perspective. And so we're, this is a cultural upheaval, which I think ultimately will be for the best, but so many people can relate that I hope that regardless of their circumstances, it'll be like, Ah, this you can connect with this music, and it can be uh, a, a gift to people, you know. So that's when it became like I'm going to release this. But that was all that 
happened. And, um, but of course I hadn't recorded anything beyond demos. And so this is the second piece of the puzzle uh, because I didn't know how it was gonna become a thing, right? We developed a relationship with Derek Furman who was Britain's producer on, on your cousin Britton Buchanan on his, his stuff. And he started ended up producing our music producing for the Mythical like Society. The Lionel Richie stuff, the Brooks and Dunn stuff, the Hazel, the Hazel Project. Yeah. Uh, and just, just love the dude and just love the way that he commits to a project and this is super technical and just like really gets involved and uh, can do, can execute very well in a number of genres. So I was just like talking to him and I was like, hey, I, I got these songs that I've been writing. Um, what would it look like if you recorded and produced them? And of course he was like, I love this idea. And so getting someone else involved in the project, yeah, that lights a fire and then you begin moving forward. And, it's, and it moves from just being a hobby and a pastime to being something a production. that this is, yeah, this is gonna be a thing. Again, from a timeline standpoint, I made that commitment last year, so that was 2021 was talking to him about it like the middle of the year and I was like, I don't know when this is gonna come out, probably 2023, that's what I told him. I was like, I don't want you to prioritize this. I cannot prioritize this because I can't work on this because I'm, it is very, very busy, have a lot of other things going on. This is a nights and weekends thing for me. And, it, and if you want it to be a nights and weekends thing for you, then I was like, don't stop working on something to work on my thing. But if you, I'll send you things as I have them, send you demos, and then so that was kind of the process. Uh, but he would like turn something around, and like I'd be like, man, that's you know that sounds a lot better than my demo, you know. Um, and I kind of got addicted to the process. Start, and I was like, well, why am I doing? I'm going to do six songs. I got more songs, and I was like, there's a lot of different. The re, the thing that sent me to eleven songs was trying to cover the breadth of the experience. I was like, well, there's this other aspect that I really wanna talk about. And then I was like, um, also I kinda feel like there needs to be like a thesis statement that is sort of the beginning of the album is the first song, which is the first single. And that's Believe Me, which was one of the, was written pretty late in the process because it was stepping back and looking at what I had done and thinking about, ah, th this would be a good thesis statement, a good opener to where I'm gonna kind of take you through conceptually on on the album, um, and so that's how I ended up getting to eleven songs. Okay. Um, and the last thing I'll talk about before we actually s listen to the single um, is why it's called James and the Shame, right? Why is it not Rep McLaughlin? So, at some point early on, I had this idea that well, what if this was like a covert thing that I didn't even talk about? but I just put out there. And then I started thinking about the fact that so much of, if, if the whole point of this thing is to connect with people who are experiencing something similar or can relate, well, one of the things that has been su such a, um, has brought those people out of the woodwork is me sharing these things through um, the public forum that I have as the public person that I am. Yeah. And so I was like, it doesn't make sense to not talk about it or try to make it seem like there's just some new country guy who's talking about spiritual things. And <laughs> if you wanna know about it, you can. Uh, but I was like, but I don't want it to be Rhett McLaughlin. I don't, call, I don't want it to be my name. I want it to be something that is like, hey, this is something outside of everything else that this guy does. When you hear the name Rhett McLaughlin, you think Rhett and Link, comedy, I'm not supposed to take this seriously. Where, when is the joke, when was the first punchline coming in this song? Right. Um, and also, I don't. It's, it, it's, it becomes pretty obvious pretty quickly. And I didn't want it to be a distraction for somebody who stumbles across it uh, in a playlist or something on Spotify to be like, Rob McLaughlin, if, if, if what I have put out into the world professionally, which is a bunch of lighthearted, silly stuff to take your mind off things, isn't your cup of tea, I don't want you to not want to listen to this if this would actually be something you'd be into. So yeah. that's where um, James and the Shame came from. James and the Shame, not only does it rhyme, is it kind of roll off the tongue, but again, shame is the dominant 
sort of emotion of the Enneagram three of someone who is performance minded. So the 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 twos, the threes, and the fours in the Enneagram are all in the heart triad. triad. Uh, and that means that there's a whole lot going on in here that they try to deal with in certain ways and the way the three deals with their shame is to try to keep performing for you. Don't, you just don't, just keep watching, watch me do cool things and you won't have to know who I really am and who I'm ashamed of. Hmm. And so that whole idea of James and the shame is like obviously the shame is, two, means two things. Number one, this was not a, it is a solo project I wrote all of the music and all of the lyrics, but the final production includes some other very talented musicians who play different instruments. And so I guess in some ways that represents the other people who collaborated to make these final products. But also, more so than that, it's the shame that follows me around wherever I go. It's like, you got James, you got the shame too. But let's, let's listen to this song, man. Okay. But, but first, let's do a quick plug. All right. Uh, Stevie's podcast comes back. We want, to, we want to show some love to best friends back. All right, her and Nagin, they they their friendship has blossomed. It, it's happened, and now they're branching out into other things. I'm told that they're going to be getting Nagin's sister, who's a gynecologist, yeah. on an episode. Yeah. So it's uh, you know I can always learn stuff from a gynecologist. They're not just talking about you know their high school days now. Now that they've rekindled the friendship, they're moving into the, the things they want to talk about. So check out Best Friends Back All Right, wherever you get your podcast. Season two is out now. It's happening. They're, turn it, they're turning another corner. Another corner. All right, you ready to play this thing? Yes, okay, so this is. I've, I've, when you played it for me, I listened to it, I think three times in a row, and then at a different occasion, I heard it again. I've only heard this song four times, and I've only heard another song once. There's only three songs that are mastered right now. Um, okay, but yes, this I'm told is, there is an album. I just don't know. So this is the first single. It's called "Believe Me." It was released on Friday, the fifteenth. So you can go to wherever you listen to music to listen to it. But we're gonna play it right now as well.
I love it, man. The first time you played this song for me, I was blown away. Like, I don't know what the look on my face was, but. You started smiling really early. I mean, yeah, right, right at the beginning, because like, you know, I'm a sound guy before a lyric guy. Right, And right. so, I was just relieved that it was really good. What, that, did, you, like, what did you think was what, what, what it was gonna be? Cause I, cause I was telling you about it, but I was perp and this is we can kind of start getting into the dynamic of like how me and you related about this because yeah. well, I, me, I, I was very much I didn't want I wanted to have something to yeah. show you well that was done I think that was I'm glad that I didn't I didn't hear anything I mean hearing what you just played is the first thing that I heard of it right specifically no demos no no sneak peeks no nothing right um. But I mean, the the production, I mean, I knew Derek was great and I knew he was gonna do something great with it and you had told me that he was hooking you up with like studio musicians, some in Nashville, some in LA, right? That were like adding, they were adding, I mean it wasn't, you know, they were adding their stuff and sending it in. Yeah, well so, uh, not, not, we thought we were gonna go Nashville because we knew we needed a, a pedal steel. But then he was like, hey, I got uh, uh, this guy I know, Alex Strahl, uh, who's, who's in LA and oh, yeah. he's like a multi-instrumentalist and he can play a mean electric guitar but he also can play the pedal steel, he can play the mandolin, he can play the banjo, this dude can play oh, wow. anything with strings. And um, so that pedal steel is Alex's like it was like a, it was passed down to him. He's got all these instruments that were passed down to him that are such so a great, old. Such a great move and to so have. So it has him. that like old school feel, which was very important. I to mean, me. th this song. I mean, I it definitely has this kind of Lord Huron vibe, which I absolutely love. And then, so like from a production instrumentation standpoint, and it. Having heard another song from the album, I know that it it doesn't just stay squarely in this place, which is right. also exciting. But yeah. for, so I'm just talking about this song, not the album, or the other song I've heard. Um, but that's tr that is true. That the, the album tr in, in itself that this is there was a reason that this was again. I wrote this song after I had written almost every song. I think I only wrote one more song after this one. So it's and, more, and, and it was like I want this to be the thematic and conceptual introduction to what the album is about, which we can get into in a second, but probably more important, getting to what you're saying is, I want this to be a sign to people who care about this type of music that this is a serious endeavor. And it, yeah, mission accomplished. I think it's, it's, it sounds great. I mean, it's definitely something that if I stumbled on this song, I would be like, what the hell? I had have to send it to you. You send it to me, right? And again, that's that was the thinking. So that's like, the, I, this that, is something that the, we would be in terms of a genre like indie western folk, like which that Lord Huron pocket. There's not, you know, there's other people doing it, but they're they're, they're my favorite. Um, and so I didn't say the word country, but then your vocals come in, and I'm like, oh, sh the first thing I thought with the very beginning of this one. 
and I don't, you know, I don't like drawing comparisons, but uh, I was like, this is this is a '90s country vocal delivery. I def it, like in the opening line. I was like, I hear Alan Jackson, mm -hmm. and I'm like, I, I knew neither one of us are huge fans of Alan Jackson, but he's so squarely '90s country right. vocal that like, and something about your tone and the melody of that first line just evoked that. Not a specific song, but him as an yeah, artist. Right. And then the, the whole song is not an Alan Jackson thing. It it actually it's, it goes very much into okay. This is this is a really good choice. It's a really strong choice, you know, for you to say I'm going to sing as a country. I'm going to sing country. I'm going to sing country vocals. And the juxtaposition of that over the production is really cool. And it's I mean it's it's not a Sturgill Simpson thing, which like some people might try to draw that comparison or whatever, because the vocals are so 90s that mm -hmm. I, th I just think that it's like a really strong, smart, it's, I almost said fun choice, but like, yeah, it's exciting. It excites me because I feel like it makes it more unique. There's, there's people, I'm not following country music that closely right now, mm -hmm. um, but I know that like the, the 90s movement that happens in fashion, it's happening in country music. There's like current stars. You played a song for me of a current up and comer who then played a song that was like very 90s intentionally. Um, I, are you talking about Luke Combs doing the Brooks and Dunn thing? Oh yeah, that was it, Luke yeah. Combs. Um, so I love, the, I love this song in terms of how it melts those things together. And then, you know the I'm a I'm a melody guy, right? So like I really like that kind of slinky. It's kind of a sly melody. What key is it in? Uh, that song is in G. I love G. I don't know. <laughs> uh, there's something something about the melody line of the verse. It's like uh, I love it. Well, it's funny because. You know, again, very little of this was calculated, right? So, but you had to make a choice to sing country, well, no, right? Yeah. So basically, so this is how that happened, right? So with that first song that I wrote, that the the old letter song, if you take the accent off of the out of the lyrics, and and I don't sing with an accent, um. Then you would be like, okay, this could be like Gregory Allen Isakov, like but, folk. But your demo had the country inflection. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. So, I, so from the get go, you were just singing country. Well, you were I'm, writing a country song. Well, I'm, I'm talking about the old, the old letter song. Yeah, the demo, the first demo you recorded. Yeah, yeah. But I'm, I'm, yeah, but I made the decision. I was like, first of all, there's a little bit of country in just the way that I talk, and so there's a little bit of country in the way that I sing. But you know how you you usually translate and you make a different decision. Like I'm trying to embody a certain character or whatever, and I, yeah, you yeah, got yeah. you got to have a sound. And so, because that's what we do. I mean, it's something that we very calculated. To say, okay, I don't want to sound like well Weird Al in this song. Well, first or of I don't want to sound like a redneck. That was such. That was one of the craziest things in 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 recording. Is that in making the decision to be like, how do I deliver this? Is me and you have recorded so much music in so many different genres. It's like, okay, this is a rap song, this is a country song, this is a hair me metal song, and we always just adapt to whatever the genre is, and we're very good chameleons. That then you have to be like, well, I gotta. That's what every artist is ultimately doing. They're like adopting, you know, you you're, you love cocaine and rhinestones, and now I'm gotten into it, and it's fascinating hearing all the stories about George Jones trying to figure out how to sound like George Jones, right? And you find yourself doing impersonations of other people. Oh, I really, that, I'm, I'm trying to sound like the Avett brothers there mm -hmm. without thinking about it. And it's, it, there's an exercise of trusting yourself to be like, no, I don't have to like try to sound like anyone. And so what is the natural melody and the natural intonation and expression that comes from me? It is a culmination of all the music that I've consumed and sung along with all those years. And that's why when I started singing country, so much 90s melodies come out right. because 
that was when I was coming of age. And it's a safe choice, I feel like, in terms of like, if you're, if you're gonna get a comparison, if you're gonna get analyzed, it's an exciting choice. So I'm, I'm really glad you made it. It's not, you know, there's Well, I guess what I'm saying is it wasn't people, a choice. People might, okay. When you, Cause it's like, when you started saying 90s and Derek started saying 90s, I was like, you know what, you're right. I was just like, I want this track to sound as old school as I can. Uh, it's got, in terms of chord structure, it gets into a little more, it's almost like gets into like Roy Orbison yeah. type, you know, cause the that's, way you- That's what I was really this, getting this at sort with of the, the key question. The sevenths kind of drop yeah, in there and stuff the like sevenths. that, which I love. There's sevenths all over this album. That's it, but, that's what I was trying to get at with the G. And that's not something that you hear it. a lot in just your average country song, yep. right? And so, and then there, you know, it's got that, and then Gunner, who, who, who did the percussion for this, uh, who's like an incredible, incredible musician, uh, kind of brought in that like shuffly yeah. rhythm, which is not when I write a, when I send a demo over, it's me and a guitar. Yeah, like you a little find the groove, like and the woodblock stuff, and it's yeah. great. Um, so anyway, those choices as you'll and we're, we're going to talk. We'll, we'll do another podcast in the fall once the whole thing's out to kind of talk more about the music. But like the ultimately, I, what I'll say at this point is that it was calculated to a degree, but most of it was just like, what do I naturally hear in this and what sounds good to me and how do I wanna sing this naturally with as much, with as little sort of acting attached to it yeah. as possible and it turns out that that is sort of this mix of old school and 90s country. And then lyrically, you know, I'm not asking to you to agree, I'm just asking you to believe me, you know, and then, I mean, it's very, it it suits country because it's kind of matter of fact, you know. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's very sincere. Um, you know, there's a sincere. It's it's there. It's not. Uh, you know, you you can really read into your experience because it's kind of on the page in a lot of ways. But it's, I, I'm not saying that as a critique. I think that fits country music really well. And I think it also just even it, though I don't. I, by the way, I wouldn't call it country album, I mean, based on this song. So it's like, that's the, I don't know where the, what I'm gonna call the album, but. Well, that's the, that's the genre that I checked in the, in the, when it, in the distribution box, because it's. Yeah, that's, it, that's good. That's the only, that's only one you can check. Yeah, that, that makes that's sense. It. And then maybe okay. like Americana yeah. as a secondary genre. So lyrically, I mean, you're really putting yourself out there. It's not, this song is not veiled. Very few of them are, and so, and I yeah. think that comes from the fact that it's like, all right, sure you can pray. I like that's the first time I heard that line, oh. you know. And I I know your experience, but I th just think it's, I mean, and I obviously I relate to it so much, so I just think it's, it's nice. I do think that people, for, ha having shared our deconstruction stories, I do think that this will be a source of comfort to people, absolutely. Like that's, um, that's powerful, you know? It's, I, mean, I the, the conversations that we've had at this table about our spiritual journeys, you know, I, I've just been blown away by how it's helped people. Hmm. And so it's so cool that I, this is gonna do that too. And it's gonna do it in a way that, it's gonna do it in a different way, you know? It, Music is so powerful. It's powerful in a totally different way than podcasts. Hmm. That is, I keep saying exciting, but I, that's just what I keep going back to is that like, you know, I'm just celebrating the fact that you're putting yourself out there, you had enough experience to know that like, how much of a risk did this feel like for you and on what area? Because when you, the, 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 this song at least, is something that you've already said a number of times. I felt like so. Where is the where is the risk? Where where is the fear? Well, I mean, I think there's an, there's a, it doesn't stay this tame. Hmm. <laughs> you know, there are some there are some what you might call angry songs where I'm just letting my emotions and the way I feel about you, are you the yelling? church. Not really yelling, in <laughs> uh, hypocrisy that I that I see and those things that get me kind of worked up. But Garth Brooks yelled in Shameless. He did. I'm shameless. Yeah, and I don't want any Chris Gaines comparisons. I appreciate hey, I you didn't not say doing it. anything. I didn't say it. Um, 
so I think that I, there's a little bit of that, but I think Chris people Gaines know, know where, people know where I stand. Um, I, I guess it is, it is, you know, every once in a while I toss a little bomb out into the pond, uh, <laughs> you know, or whatever the analogy, that's not a good one. Uh, I stir things up, I kick the hornet's nest a little bit for those people who care to, to, to feel offended by the things that I say. Um, is it, it, let me ask you this So the, it's, it do, it's gonna stir that up a little bit. Do you, have you felt like it was a bigger risk creatively to like put yourself out there um, as by doing this project than, which, or is it what you're saying in the lyrics? Is it the message that you're getting across? Because th there's a there's a creative risk involved in saying, "Hey, I'm I'm one half of Rent and Link. This is what you know me for. I'm a comedian." You know, it's like there's a. If it were me, I would have to get over this hurdle of like embarrassment that would be like, you know, is there risk there? Is there fear there? Has that been part of this? You know, for better or for worse, I, I just always approach things just believing that I'm going to find some way to pull them off, and 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 it's probably okay. a, It's probably a um, misguided self confidence that yes, I can do this and I can make an album that I would actually, if I were not myself, enjoy and like. Well, um, I'm not embarrassed for you now that I've heard. It. <laughs> uh, I'll say that. But I mean, to, I guess. To, but yeah, that moment when you're like, for the first time here and on GMM, when you're saying, I've released a country music, you know, there's a little, there's album. There is there a sheepishness there? Well, is there I, like, I think from a creative standpoint, when one of the things you're most well known for is like being on your knees and having your best friend pee chocolate into your mouth from a fountain that is next to his penis. I just don't think there's a lot of things you can do to creatively embarrass yourself, honestly. And oh. in one sense, I think that gets into one of the sort of unrealized motivations to do something like this is, you know me, I talk about it all the time, is that I do have this chip on my shoulder creatively. You know, um, there's lots of things that we want to do collectively to show people what we are capable of creatively. And I think there's always an element of that in everything that I do. And so I can't, I'm not gonna be dishonest with you and tell you that I believe in what I've created here and I think it's good and I think other people will agree and I and there's a part of my ego that wants you to agree. Um, okay, you, well then I've stroked your ego enough but I also think I'm projecting, I guess, in that if I were in your shoes that's how I would feel. So instead, I think it's, you know, I think it's, it's something that's um, inspiring about the fact that you have this like this this confidence. And maybe it comes from a chip on your shoulder or whatever, but like you you want to express yourself in this way and you go for it, and that's something that uh, you know I could do more of, you know. So if I am to make this about me for a second, uh, I do feel like it's like oh I would I would be embarrassed at every turn. You know, even the thing about talking about like being a DJ, I had to make a decision to say, mm -hmm. you know, this is kind of a, this is not, some, you know, I had to decide what my, um, uh, what my posture was gonna be about it. Right. You know? It's yeah. like, yeah, this is something that I'm into. Uh, and I'm not gonna be sheepish or apologetic or embarrassed by having some sort of, you know, creative outlet or aspirations. So uh, I think that's where that question was coming from. It's more about me than you, but uh, No, but I, I, I have thought about it because the, the worst case scenario is people are like, this YouTube guy thinks he's a musician now. <laughs> Who cares? Right. Okay, I've lost nothing. I, I, you know, if you already see me as that, if you see me as this YouTube guy, this hack that just stumbled into fame, and isn't really talented, then nothing. If you already think that, then you thinking that again is not a problem for me. You know what I'm. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. So, what is the? Is, is there bigger? There's bigger risks, uh, content-wise, in other songs. Yeah, it gets more. It gets more explicit. Literally, there's a few f bombs dropped on the album. You know, 
to 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 you know to give a hint of that. Are you nervous about any of any of the specifics coming out? I mean, what? No. Where's you? I'm not, no, no, I, I just. I mean, you wrote a, you said you wrote a song to your kids, you wrote a song to your parents. Um, well, uh, yeah, I, uh, the, I, you know, I don't know how much I wanna talk about the, I mean, I have a great relationship with my parents, but the thing that I am conscious of is that because they are still very much strong Christians and I'm very much a public figure who has stated that I am not and that I'm critical of Christianity, that, makes their life more difficult than I would like it to be, right? Um, because of the way people in the church are, you know? Uh, and so, and just the way people in general are, I'm not just single out people in the church, it's just if somebody that you're related to is talking shit about what you're all into, then they become a little bit of a scapegoat. And I, and, and so, you know, I, I, I'm sensitive to that, and that's, in some ways that's kind of what the song to them is about. Um, well, we can leave it, leave that part at that, because I, I do think I would like to, I, I'm gonna hear the whole album at some point, and then if we can kinda, I'm sure we'll revisit yeah, this. Yeah, 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 yeah. But, you know, in terms of when we started talking about it, I was trying to remember when that was. Do you remember, because I think there were like hints of, I'm writing some song, I'm writing some songs, and I, rem I, re I just remember the first time it kinda registered was maybe you had mentioned it a few times, but you had mentioned it in EP. I think that's the first time I was like, what? Mm -hmm. You just, you, you're gonna, okay, so you're, you're not just writing songs, you're, you're gonna release songs. You know, like, um, what, what, were, what were you thinking there? Because again, it's like, it, it what you just told, Everybody for the you know for the past hour is not was not the entry point for our conversation. We we never sat down and you said you know, hey I'm you gave me this whole story. Mm -hmm. So to me, my experience was, oh he's doing this thing he doesn't want to talk about, but then he feels like he needs he. Apparently, it's gaining momentum because he's talking about making an EP. So now he's mentioning it to me, and I respect that. Like I have an appreciation for it now, given what you said. It's like it's a deeply personal exercise that is an uh, uh, an application of therapy that then you would obviously talk to Jesse about, <laughs> you know, in the same way that there's plenty of stuff in my personal journey in my heart, in my therapy sessions that I process myself, first of all. And then there's thing, there's m much of that, that um, the vast, vast majority of that, that I'll bring, that Christy and I will discuss and I'll bring her into. And then, you know, so I recognize that then there's certain things at certain times that I'll bring you into it. And it's not even a calculation of I'm keeping things from you, it's just that like, you know, there's only so many hours in a day, yeah. and even though we spend the majority of them together, we're always occupied yeah. with the things that we're doing. Jesse asks me multiple times a week, did you talk to Link about so-and-so? I'm like, baby, I, no, because we talked about every other thing. You right. know what I'm saying? Like, but Because we, we're so constantly I, doing I other I recognize all that. Yeah. But my experience with it was, you know, it, you know, it, it was just a little, a little thing here. A little thing there, an EP, an mm -hmm. album, uh, and so I'm like, without having the full story, I think there was a lot of, well, I'm just left to like, okay, how am I gonna respond to this? Yeah, and, and again, none of that was calculated. I mean, I, I, if I think back and try to figure out why that was the way that it happened, I think there is a part of my, there's a part of me that believes, and this is just kind of the way my brain works, is like sometimes talking about something, the only thing that is good that comes from talking about something is talking yourself out of it. And so I don't like to talk a lot about things. I just like to keep doing them. So you're saying if you would have talked to me about it, you would have talked yourself out of it. I think that I think that not I'm, again. I haven't thought about this at all, but I think that there is a there there is a fear that like because this doesn't make any sense, 
because I don't have time for this, because this is not necessarily a good business decision. If we start talking about it, to then like talk about it from a strategic standpoint or a positioning standpoint, it may just float away as a, it may just not be a priority. But for me, it okay, was like, th this is a, this is a personal thing that I'm like, I, I'm revisiting on my own time. It was up until very, very recently, I never did any of this during work hours. This past couple of months, there's been a couple of days where I was like, I have to go record this or I have to do that. That's kind of gotten into my regular schedule, but because it was very so much something that I just kept pushing forward in, in my free time, so to speak, free time, air quotes, um, I think it was, there was just this unspoken, I don't wanna sit down and have a real serious conversation about this because I don't wanna slow it down because I'm, I'm, it's gaining so much momentum personally. Not that you I thought, thought that, that if you we, would talk me out of it. That's not really what I'm saying. But I hear you saying that if we talked about it, it would very quickly get to like, you know, um, how, what is the, what is the feasibility of this? There's not, you know, there's not, there's not a lot of positives to it in terms of like mythical, unless you're really talking about, I wanna do this as a solo artist and this, you know, if it became a, some mythical endeavor from a business standpoint, there's a lot more questions that all feel like roadblocks to this personal project if we had that conversation. And that's why I did, that's why I took a long time to, I didn't talk to anyone here about it for the longest time for the same reasons, because like, guys, you may interpret this as a selfish act if I start talking about it. And you're like, well, why, we're all working so busy and you're off of making your little, your little album. So, you know what I'm saying? It's you, like, you didn't eh. bring it up because it could be a, it could be perceived as like a threat to the, the business. Yeah, now I firmly believe that it is not, and I have a lot of reasons for believing that it's not. I mean, I, I, I think that the way I kind of analyze that is, it's funny because what we have is incredibly unusual. There, I, I actually can't think of a entertainment duo where they're bo both people are qualified entertainers and Literally every expression of that is in is only in the context of that. Almost every duo that there's an example of is just like, oh yeah, and he does his little thing, his little side hobby thing. It's like super common, right? And but then oh, but the the main thing they do is the stuff that they do together. I always thought that the reason that that hadn't been the case up until now is twofold. Number one, it's like we just never have time for anything. And number two, it just never, it never, I never had an idea that it made sense to go and do by myself until this. So it, it, it isn't like I've been sitting around thinking. I find it unusual that we haven't done anything solo independently of each other for this, for all these years. But I also find it, oh, it kind of makes sense because we, there hasn't been, neither of us have had something where it's just like, I've got to get this into the world. This is the first thing that came along to me, it doesn't feel like a, a threat to what we have. If anything, it feels like, because it's not a replacement of anything that we're doing. Well, I, it, it, in, in some ways it feels like another facet to the Rhett side of Rhett and Link. Do you know what I'm, you know what I'm getting at? Yeah, I think that there was, so it was the, was this a, a threat to the, to the business strategy of what we're doing? But then there's another part that's like, if I bring this up, would it, will it, will will it be, will Link perceive it as a threat to their, to our creative partnership? And I thought that, and or I, or more, or our friendship. I don't know. Well, and again, while it wasn't calculated, if you were to ask me, like, okay, well, all right, that. The, we're gonna have to have a really long conversation about this that is going to, again, I didn't think this, but I may have been thinking it subconsciously. That it's just like, okay, if we have a conversation about this at a really early stage, it may really just get bogged down. You know, because now in my mind, what went from being this, this thing that was gaining momentum, it's so difficult to get things to happen and bring things into the world. You, we know that, right? And when I 
subconsciously perceive that there might be a conversation or some point that becomes a point of impasse, I'm like, I don't wanna have that. I don't wanna, I don't, I don't wanna do that. Like, let's let this actually begin to become something and then we can have a conversation about it versus having a conversation about it a year ago, you know? Not that we didn't talk about it, not that you didn't know about it, but it wasn't like, hey, let's sit down and literally hash this thing out. Because in some ways, the other part of my brain was thinking, there's nothing to hash out. Like, I'm doing this thing, if you were doing this thing, I'd be like, that's awesome, that's cool, man, do it. Now, if it suddenly we can't do something that we wanna do because you're doing this, then we can have a conversation. But if that's not the case, just keep going. You know, if it's make if it's making you a better, more fulfilled person, then that makes you a better, more fulfilled comedy partner, you know, business partner, and friend. If you're pursuing your passion and doing something that's bringing you joy in life, so I think that that that's my that's how I feel about it. Honestly, that's why I feel like it's a he a healthy thing for me and ultimately for us, because anything that's healthy for me is healthy for us and vice versa. Anything that's helpful for you is helpful for uh, is healthy for us. Yeah, when I I mean when I hear that, I'm like, is that true? There has to be an exception to that rule, right? It's like that just can't. Is, could that just be true across the board? You know, I actually that's my gut reaction to that statement. I think that you know, my preference would have been to talk about it earlier. But I think it's, again, this is more about me than it is about you. It's not like, uh, so I had, because I think that that's true, because there's, you know, the, yeah, it's like, if I hear you're making an EP or doing this thing, the first thing I'm gonna think, is, the first thing I did think was not, I'm so excited for you. I want to celebrate this. It's like, what does this mean for us? Yeah. And, you know? Um, and it taps into some insecurity. And you know, I know that there's, uh, you know, I, I don't wanna overblow this whole abandonment issue thing, but that's it's there, right? So it's, you know, I that's part of my process. But, I mean, we had had conversations about this related to other stuff. So, I, I, Actually, this project didn't bring this to a head as much as like when you know, I don't we don't have to get into the details of it, but my response to this project, this album of yours um was shaped by the experience that we had on Ronstadt. Mm -hmm. You know, because that was the the genesis of that project was messy, right? Like literally like the first email and slacks and, and stuff that was going around about analyzing the opportunity to, yeah. to partner um, and, and work on Ronstadt yeah. and be attached to it. You know, the way, that that, the way that that started was just messy. And it was something that then, you know, there were, we had to work through it. Right. Well, and meaning that when when we were first approached about that, the ask was, "Can Rep play Ronstadt?" Which was not a thing that we had. Like we don't. Right. We don't go out pursuing opportunities. Now we may do. We we both we don't haven't done a lot lately, but we both audition for roles that if we were to, you know, we'll never we'll never get one. But. We do it kind of for fun, and maybe one would come, and we would, oh, your Link's going to be on this show, or Link's going to make a guest appearance, and he's not going in as Rhett and Link is going in as Link, and vice versa. So that's been a conversation, but that was being brought into Mythical as a Mythical project. Be like, oh, Mythical is going to right. actually help produce this, but the ask was for Rhett to play Ronstadt, and right. so how do what do we how do we make this a Rhett and Link thing, and that became the conversation as opposed to oh, it's going to be a Mythical thing that Rhett is doing. Yeah, but the way, and then the way that it became a conversation was just not smooth, you know? Yeah. That we would, we, we, we've talked about it and we have learned that we would have done things differently, right? Yeah. So I don't wanna, you know, I just feel like that gives context to this because I feel like by moving through that and growing through that, we were able to articulate, um, our desires, like you were able to articulate some of your desires for, well, 
you know, it's, do, let's, do we have to do every single thing together? You know, we started having conversations about this. I think there's a whole other podcast in here. I'm just gonna allude to it. And then, uh, yeah, and then I'm bringing it to the table, well, you know, very early on, we made this choice that we weren't gonna, everything we're gonna do, we're gonna do together. So it's like, okay, now are we revisiting that? And what does that mean? And how far does that go? Well, it turns out it's still, it, it's not that drastic. It's just that because of my makeup and what I'm bringing to the table, it's, it's scarier for me. And I think there is a, I, you know, in me giving off that energy, I think when it comes around to this project, I mean, you're probably gonna have this sense that I'm gonna be more concerned about it than excited first. Mm -hmm. But we we benefited from going through, uh, an, you know, getting on the same page on the Ronstadt project, getting on the same page about um, just our approach to things at Mythical and how, you know, I, there's so much in this that I just, I, I know I'm flirting with it, but, I guess the point I'm making right now is that we really had a, a series of good conversations that got us more on the same page. You know, having the mantra of saying, when in doubt, talk it out, you know, is, is something that we really benefited from. So when, and ironically, a lot of you doing the songwriting and stuff was happening in parallel to all this, but when it came to a point of, you were ready to talk about it, then I was in a much better place to receive it. Hmm. Um, and and that was even without the benefit of the entire backstory that you just shared of like the, 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 the personal process of it. But seeing it as, like not seeing it as a threat to what we're doing is something that I can say with to, to the 98th degree that I can, you know, and, and that's saying I, and a lot. And I do think that it's, if it hasn't been obvious up until this point, so this is not me saying that I want to go and be a full-time musician. Right. I'm not touring. I don't have time to tour. Even if I wanted to go around playing these songs. Uh, I'm not saying I'll never play these songs for someone, for a, for a crowd, I'm just saying that that's not, the intention isn't like, now I'm a musician and that's what I do. It's more like, hey, this has always been a, a, a very much a hobby of mine and it'll be cool to have this sort of ongoing thing because I expect to release more music because it's like, hey, I wrote a song, let's record it, let's release it. It's something that I can responsibly fit into my schedule and not drop the ball with what we're doing here but just so just that this isn't like I'm going to pursue a career as a musician and that's what I do. It's more like, well, I was already a musician and now I'm releasing some music that is just mine. Um, yeah, and I also started to realize that over the course of the pandemic, I, you know, when I started the listening party broadcast on Instagram, you know, to like take my personal creative outlet of like, listening to music, making playlists, and turn that into something that involved our audience, you know, it was something that I didn't calculate. And then at the moments when I talked to you about it, I had that sheepish like, this is not really a thing, because it, first of all, it wasn't, but I felt like we didn't have like just a clear conversation about it. It was more like, I, yeah, I'm doing this thing, it'll be fun, oh, I'm gonna do 21 of these, mm -hmm. you know, as it turns out. And I think you're different than me in that I do think you are more inclined to be encouraging about it because of what, of because you were doing other stuff too. You saw a parallel. I mean, yeah. did you? Um, I mean, I, I, I see a parallel and now, and that's helpful for me. I guess, I guess ultimately what I'll say is that like a lot of these things don't cross my mind unless someone else brings them up. Okay, you yeah. You know, it, it's just my my disposition is different. And so, like I haven't thought about the fact that you're also doing your own podcast. Right, and you know what, you saying that doesn't hurt my feelings because I know you. Yeah. But I think there was a point when it could have hurt my feelings 
And it might have just been two years, three years ago. You're saying two that years ago. the fact that it doesn't cross my mind that you're doing yeah, a because project. It, it's like, right. Yeah, because. Because well, you're like, well, I would care if you were doing a podcast. Exactly, right, right. Yeah, and I think I just, I think ultimately, for me, it's like, I just have, I know that we both have so many independent interests and desires and things that we want to do and accomplish that if those things can can happen and not sacrifice all the things that we want to do together, then that's a beautiful thing. I mean, these things are, this is different because your podcast with your dad is a mythical production. I, well, I was talking about the listening party. Yeah. Which I think the thing that's the same is also like me saying, oh, you know what? I'm a I I I like I'm pursuing the skill of being a DJ. If that means I'm going to actually get a gig being a DJ somewhere sometime, you know, uh, on my own time, I'm sure it would be something that you would celebrate and you wouldn't think twice about it in the way that I might have thought twice yeah. about your album. Because it's just like it's a hobby, it's an outlet, it's a side project that who knows still might lead to something. You know, I do think we can talk about that. But the thing about the, like just to put a finer point on me and being inspired by your exercise is that in a way that we're different, like I haven't given myself permission. Like you say, we both have the all these aspirations, but we do not have them to the same level. And that's something that uh, I, I am drawing inspiration from that I could grow in that area. Like the podcast with my dad is, is, is a great outlet. Like it's, a, it's been a highlight of my week whenever we get together and, and, and do it. It's a creative outlet. It is part of mythical. It's something that we are doing that, you know, uh, we split it down the middle, you know? Well, and, uh, but it, it wasn't my idea, you know? As far as I can recall, it was Stevie's, it was idea. Stevie's yeah. idea. And I was like, well, this sounds like a great idea that I'm never going to do, is, was my first reaction. And then when she kept talking about it. It definitely, you. you then my next reaction was, this still sounds like a decent idea that I'm never going to do. You had to be kind of dragged into it. Yeah, and or, even, or, or you know, it's like when, even once my dad was on board and it was happening, like I was like, this isn't really, we're not really gonna do this. It's like I didn't give myself permission to say, do I wanna do this? Or I do wanna do this. And it might fail, we might fall flat on our face, but I'm gonna do it because I'm excited about it. You know, that's a, I think your encouragement and like following this journey for you has been, it's it's gotten me, it's gotten me off the dime a little bit. Um, not in a, oh shit, if he's gonna do something, I gotta do something. But actually in a creative outlet, um, just tapping into my desires kind of way, in, in, in like a, a mostly pure motive kind of way, you know? It's not like a tit for tat thing. Yeah. So I'm actually like listening to that song and like being able to celebrate it and celebrate what's happening with this project is is something that I'm proud of for me. So it's you know it's not something that I'm conjuring anymore out of some sense of obligation. Right. Well, and to, to clarify, the James and the Shame project is not a part of Mythical. But the reason that it's not a part of Mythical is because. I did not want to make anyone here have to work on it. Kara, uh, our, our personal assistant, has been helping, but beyond that, very few people have been involved and every single expense has come out of my pocket, which I am reasonably certain I will not make money from this project. Yeah, you didn't want me to lose money. <laughs> but then, hey, if this gets wildly successful, like, I mean, I, you're probably gonna have to cut me in somehow. <laughs> We'll have to talk about yeah, it. Yeah, so that that's the only reason it's not, and it's also this is not a core fo like a, a funny podcast with your dad is a is a part of the core sort of focus right. of mythical. A serious country album about deconstruction is not part of the core mission of mythical. So there's a number of reasons that it's not a mythical thing, and that also is one of the reasons that I don't really work on it here or with the people at this company, and I work on it outside of my normal responsibilities here. Um. But, but we're at we're at a point in our career when we can do things that are associated with our careers that don't involve the other person but can but will be a part of mythical. Of course. Like 
so Dispatches from Myrtle Beach is an, a great example of that. Yeah, and I mean, and no, there, there, you know, there may be other things. There should be other things. Well, to, so one of the things we haven't talked about, I know we're going a little bit long, but it's fine. Um, I think that there, I mean, I inter- I'm interested how you feel about Dispatches from Myrtle Beach in regards to this because one of the things, first of all, I get so creatively frustrated because as much as we put out into the world, there's a lot more that doesn't make it out into the world because of limitations, because we're we're conceptualizing things that need to be greenlit by people and they need to be financed and they have to go through pitch meetings, et cetera, et cetera. And some of the ideas that I'm most passionate about that I feel are most representative of us creatively are things that we can't just put out on YouTube for free. They have to be financed and it's a different model. And very few of those things have made it to the to, to where people can enjoy them. Yeah. With music, it's no one else. Like if I can get somebody to I don't even have to get somebody to produce it. Like I could just record it <laughs> you know, at the creative house and release it. Like it and you you can just go through Spotify or what you just get just distribute your music. There's been something so freeing and life giving in just something happening, like having an idea and then it can just be birthed and given to the world. But part of that has been in yep, doing it independently and it not being a collaborative thing. To me, there there's been it's made me appreciate the things that are collaborative. Um And I've also just, hey, this is on me. Like, I gotta finish this. I have to be the one to make the call. I've got to make these decisions and move this forward. And then also like do a bunch of things that I haven't done in years. Like I did the, uh, the, I designed the artwork for the, for the first single. I don't design artwork. Yeah, I was very surprised. But I was like, I don't want, I don't wanna pay somebody else. I'm paying so many people to do so many parts of this. I don't wanna pay somebody else to do this. It feels like I can figure this out. But there's been something very rewarding about just conceptualizing and executing something and putting it out into the world on my own. I haven't done that in so long. Yeah, There's been something personally rewarding in doing that. Not because it's like, oh, finally I get to do something on my own. It's just like, oh no, I I made a decision to do this on my own and it's been life-giving. I th- in, a, in, a di- in a different way than the collaboration. Yeah, um, I think that fans of ours, Mythical Beasts will ask, yeah, but I mean, why, I mean, there's backup, uh, there's, why there's didn't harmony, sing, uh, sing why, on it? why didn't you get him to sing some, why didn't you get him to sing some harmony on that, you know? And that was, a, that, that was very specifically a calculated decision. Talk about that. Um, because we haven't talked about that, but I, I'm reading between the lines and I, I. Yeah, because when I sing melody and you sing harmony, that's a Rhett and Link song. That's that's a Rhett and Link song. This isn't a Rhett and Link project. And I don't want people to think that it, it, it needs to be its own thing, right? It doesn't need to be like, oh, Rhett and Link also made a country album. Right. No, 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 it's, it's not a Rhett and Link thing. It's a red thing, and that's okay. And and you know what? That's that, that's good, is what I'm saying. Um, sure, you would have been great at it. Um, you know, I think that. But I, but even even from a sonic st- standpoint, I want it to feel like its own thing. Me and you singing together is a very specific, great, and beautiful thing. But it's a red and link thing. I don't want to take the red and link thing and spread it over into this. That cheapens the Rhett and Link thing and it cheapens the James and the Shame thing, you know? And so I want this to have a, si- a signature sound. So like in that song that we listened to today, that's Derek singing, he's a great vocalist. That's him singing the, 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 the backup lyrics. But there are songs where I sing my own harmony when, when it makes sense thematically. There are songs where Jesse sings harmony where it makes sense thematically. Um, but, the thing that, did, if I had a song about you on the album, then it would make sense for you, you know what I'm saying? Then it would make sense for you to 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 to, to sing the song. It was like, to me it was about 
theme. Unless it's about me being dead. (laughs) And standing on its own. And it was like, hey, like I, at one point it became almost out of principle. Like I don't want Link to hear this until it's done because it's not a Rhett and Link thing, not out of spite, but because of all the reasons that we just covered. And it's like, I don't wanna complicate that. I don't wanna complicate that and muddy that. If it really is a Rhett thing, then let it be a Rhett thing. And something that then I can just kind of present to you and you can enjoy. And honestly, I've been treating dispatches from Myrtle Beach the exact same way. Like I haven't, I I am, at the time that we're recording this, we're, the first episode's about to drop, and that's when I'm gonna listen to it for the first time. I'm gonna listen to it as a fan of listening to you and your dad talk, not as somebody who's a producer. And it's gonna be like, well, let me give you some feedback on that. Do you know what I'm saying? Yeah. And to me, there's something healthy about that separation. I respect that. I understand that. Um, Is there anything else that you wanted to share? Um. I don't think so. I mean, obviously, I'll, I'll I'll use this time to say that I am genuinely interested in a lot of people hearing this, um, and so it gets to the people who it will impact in the way that I would like to see them impacted. So, do all the things that you do with the musicians that you like. You know, listen to it, mm-hmm. follow me on those places. I'm not. I am creating like. I think you should refer to you you refer to it in third person. I, I'm creating James and the Shame profiles in different places, but only as placeholders so people don't steal them. But all updates about this are going to come through all my uh, initial social channels. So you can go like follow those play, those those accounts over there just so the, somebody will be following them. But it's primarily going to just be done through all my stuff. But I I would like. Uh, it would do nothing, I would, it would do my heart very, very well for somebody out there who likes this kind, the only reason they're listening to what I'm doing is because they like the music. And then they're like, this isn't, this guy's not singing about the stuff that I typically listen to in country music. This guy seems to be challenging. It would be cool some if it developed that, a, a life of its own. Yeah, and so, and, and that again is, is that's my desire is that this thing has a has a home in people who will relate to the story that I that I'm telling. And so if you think you know somebody who is like, I've never sent anything to this person because I know they're not gonna like X, Y, and Z that these guys have done. If you're like, oh, they might he might they might like this, send it to them. So that's what I would ask the mythical beast is just like give it a chance. Don't see it as a threat. Hopefully what we've talked about today has if that was your concern, that you, you you understand that this is a this is about um, personal expression and ultimately a healthy thing that is not a existential threat to mythical or anything Rhett and Link. If anything, an enhancement to what we're doing here. Um, but also share it with people who you think might like it. That's all I'll say. Awesome. All right. I think you're supposed to have a wreck. Are you wrecking your own single? Uh, man, I can't, That's, it I seems can't like do you kind of have to just do it. Just wreck uh, your own single. Yeah, yeah. I recommend that you go over. What's it called? Uh, it's called Believe Me. And uh, at some point, I, I am going to have. Uh, there's going to be some James in the Shame merch. I don't know if that'll be the case by the time this goes up, but there's, oh. there's nipple good, clamps. There's going to be some of that as well, so you can spread you can spread the word. Uh, but I'll, I'll just say, just follow me where you listen to your music and and listen. Put it in your put it in a playlist, whatever you do with music. All right. Next week, we'll talk at you. Hashtag Ear Biscuits. Hi, Rhett and Link. I was just listening to the podcast where you're discussing um, keeping the shower curtain open or closed when you're done with it. I'm very passionate about keeping the shower curtain open because I don't want a serial killer to be hiding behind it. Just thought I'd mention it because I didn't know the default was to keep it closed all the time. So I'm here to say, keep your shower curtains open so that there's no serial killers. Thank you. Bye. Hi, Red and Link. My name is Molly. I just wanted to let you guys know that I just had dental surgery and was listening to your podcast while I was breathing in the nitrous oxide. And for a couple minutes there, I transformed myself into 
the table of dim lighting and I saw you two and also Stevie. So it was a very weird experience, but I'm very grateful for it. You guys got me through the surgery, so thanks. Hey, Rhett. Hey, Link. Uh, my name is Jesse. I live in Sugar Grove, Ohio. I've been a fan for a long time, but I'm only calling in to say, Link, I think the funniest thing about dispatches from Myrtle Beach is the pain <laughs> that you feel when your dad says certain things. I'm listening to episode two and he was explaining the metal fan talking about that metal rock music and your pause was the funniest thing. So I just, I love it. Uh, keep doing what you do guys. Bye. To watch more Ear Biscuits, click on the playlist on the right. To watch the previous episode of Ear Biscuits, click on the playlist to the left. And don't forget to click on the circular icon to subscribe. If you prefer to listen to this podcast, it's available on all your favorite podcast platforms. Thanks for being your mythical best.